each word and each letter and each picture it represents and each numerical value that it represents, I bet if we understood it to its nth degree, like Matt said last Sunday, you wouldn't read sentences anymore. You'd read three words, stop, and be stuck for months because there's so much truth bound up in every single word. In fact, every alphabetic letter in the Hebrew language has truths behind it, and they all reveal God's character. So that's where we're going today. Look, at I even brought my Hebrew to show me how to write it so that you can remember and write it down in your journals. Um, okay, if you have your Bibles, which you should, turn to Hebrews chapter... Seven, I want to read you the story of uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. This King Melchizedek of Salem... Oh, i got to say this before I start. Um, the reason I know this is a powerful sermon is not because I'm awesome, but because the message is awesome. And the reason I know is because I think this is... I think this is Matt's message. And he got so sick he couldn't preach it. And so he gave it to me. And then I was going to preach it. And I came in this morning. And you know how the devil always tries to draw your attention away from what's really important? I'm sitting at the back and I'm waiting for worship to go. And I'm listening to what Brad's saying and getting all excited because there's just so much stuff going on in my mind. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to tell these people all this cool stuff. And I get a text on my phone. And for those of you who don't know, I'm a, I'm a commercial property manager. Um, I look after uh, some retail or some office buildings here in Calgary and some warehouses up in Edmonton. And I get a text on my phone just before we started singing that we had a water main break in one of our buildings and we have four tenant spaces completely flooded and it's probably five to $600,000 worth of damage. So I run outside and I'm phoning people in Edmonton and I'm trying to organize restoration crews and blah, 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 all the while telling them, I, you know, I, I, I can't help you. I have to go back into the church to preach. <laughs> so... I, I promised myself that if, if they call and, and have a problem, I'm going to answer the phone, and then you guys will all scream out, Jesus loves you, or something, just so, <laughs> just so they know that they're actually interrupting me. Anyway, but it's interesting, because as soon as that happened, I thought, you know what, the devil's trying desperately to, to get this message, distract me so this message can't get preached, and, and, and so I know this is awesome. So, so let's read the story of... of this King Melchizedek of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned one-tenth of everything. His name, in the first place, means king of righteousness. Next, he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Did you know that Jerusalem used to be called just Salem back in, the, back in Abraham's day? Okay, so this is the city that, that we're actually referring to. It wasn't even a city then, and he met him there soon to be Jerusalem. Uh, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God and remains a priest forever. See how great he is? Even Abraham the patriarch, and there's nobody in, 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 in Judaism higher in esteem than Abraham. Abraham is the guy that started it all. He is, he's the, the, the top dog. So for somebody to be, to be considered greater than Abraham... For a, a person studying Hebrew, pretty significant. The patriarch gave him a tenth of the spoils, and those descendants of, of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to collect tithes from the people, that is, from the kindred, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not belong to their ancestry, collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had received the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by those who are mortal, in, in the other, by one who has testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, pays tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. What it's basically saying is, is that an, an, an act of... We use the word tithing. I, I know when we get into grace preaching, we, we tend to throw the word tithing out because it's, it has law written on it. And we're so used to hearing people say, if you don't tithe, you're cursed. And if you don't give X, then you're going to hell and whatever. And, and it's, largely, it's largely because people in the ministry are trying to fund their ministry. And so they're 
they're browbeating everybody else to make sure that they give up a portion of their. And the Catholics were really good at it. If you don't tithe, you can, you can tithe your, your loved ones out of hell, for crying out loud. I mean, you really think God can be bought off after the person's dead? I mean, anyway, so we, 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 we don't like to use the word tithe, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word tithe because in this instant, Abraham chooses to tithe the tenth of all his spoil. A tenth of everything that he had received in, in, in plundering the kings. And he gives it to Melchizedek as, as an act of reverence. Um, Melchizedek in this story is referred to as being greater than Abraham. Because Melchizedek is, 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 a, is a type of Christ or a pre-incarnate version of, of Jesus himself. Who meets Abraham after he plunders the kings and he blesses him. So the... So the the, greater, the the lesser is blessed by the greater. And as an act of gratefulness or whatever, Abraham gives him a tenth of everything. Now, it has nothing to do with law because the law didn't come for another 400 years. Abraham did this because this is what he deemed to be a, a, an act, an acceptable act on his part in light of the blessing. And then it talks about the Levites, who, who were then one of the, the 12 children of Jacob, who were then set aside for the priesthood and the ministry, the pastors, priests, and whatever. And they lived off the tithe. So the tithes were brought to the storehouse and were dropped off as an act, a continuing act from what Abraham had done. So his descendants follow suit and they bring in their tithes and put it in the storehouse. And from the storehouse, the Levites, who now don't work but just serve God permanently or, or full time, um, are fed from those tithes. So the idea is that we bring a tenth of our, of our, our fruits or our labors, whatever, and put it in the storehouse so that God's services can be accomplished and we benefit from them so as we pay the pastor he feeds us that kind of thing and it's interesting because <laughs> there's so many good sermons on giving and 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 why it works and how it works and and the de degrees to which it works and yet whenever it comes from the pastor we always kind of go eh, i know yeah i should give more i should give more but every time you say that basically i know it's going to go in the pot it's going to go into the bank and it's going to go pay to you so if you feel like you're getting short-suited or you don't have enough money or you didn't make enough last month, you're just going to preach on giving and then we'll give more because, you know, we feel compelled to give more and then, and then you just make more money. So every time you don't have any money, you'll preach on giving. Well, I can assure you I'm not getting any of that money. And I'm preaching on giving. <laughs> so, there. So the tithe. First of all, before we get started, this sermon is going to be... This is a roadmap. See, let me start here, and you go through all those things, and, you, and you, there's the X that marks the spot, okay? It's a roadmap to riches. So, it is. Don't laugh. This was the sermon's about. So, we, we need to determine, if, if this is important to us, we need to determine what riches is, and whether or not it, we, we need to find a roadmap, roadmap to get there, whether it's worth pursuing. So, what is riches? I mean... Too often we equate riches with money, and, and we can look down the street and see a poor person living in a small house and a, big, a rich person living in a big house driving a fancy car. I firmly believe that the true definition of riches is, is, is defined in this. Healthy, wealthy, and wise. Because if you are super duper healthy and you're broke, eh, life sucks. If you got all the money on the planet, but you're lying in a sick bed, eh, life sucks as well. If you're really healthy and you got all the money in the world, but you're an idiot, <laughs> then this isn't going to save you. Because without wisdom, you're just headed off the map. So I don't care how much health you have and how much wealth you have. If you don't have wisdom, then life is going to be problematic. So it's the combination of these three, these three things. To, to be protected divinely in our health, to be provided for divinely in our wealth, and we all know where wisdom comes from. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We also know that, that Jesus has been referred to as wisdom incarnate. We, we, can't, we can't be wise if we don't understand, if we don't have the fear of God or reverence for God, or if we don't understand who Jesus is and what his job was and what he's done. It, it's hard to go through life making decisions based on the world's economy, based on the world's politics. Based on, if you do that, you'll be just running around chasing your tail. If, if you make your decisions based on the fact that, like Matt's been preaching for weeks, that the world isn't getting worse, it's getting better. Why? Because Jesus' job is done. 
Everything that he was required to do to solve sin entering the world is finished. It's not like Jesus has eight things to do. He's done four of them. He's going to come back and do another one on Friday. And then he's going to do another one next year and whatever. No, he went, he, he rose again and went up to heaven and sat down, which means his job is finished. There is no more work required from him. So what that means is everything that he's accomplished is already ours. That inheritance is already ours. That, that storehouse of resources is already ours. The, the atonement for all the sins we're ever going to commit is already there. Everything that we need to go back to Eden, go back to a place where we are divinely healthy, wealthy, and wise, Jesus has already done that. There was a time when it hadn't been done yet. Now it's finished. He's done. So it's our job. Now, in this roadmap, I want to talk about tithing. Because, first of all, I want to give you an example of... I want to give... Man, I hope I do this justice. I want to give you an example of some of the truth, interesting truth that you will find in the Hebrew language if all you do is just study the words. So here it goes. Uh, a simple word like um, God created Adam and Eve. Uh, he, he made man in his image. And then out of man, he created woman, right? Pretty early in, 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 in the story. So let's go back and discuss these two words. Shall we? Okay. Now, in Hebrew, this word is ish. It is spelt. Here we go. Remember, Hebrew reads from right to left, not left to right. It's like Chinese, okay? So I'm going to write it this way. So uh, ish is spelt. Just so I can do it right. All right, here's your Hebrew lesson. Uh. Oh, that's bad. Oh, well. Okay, so trust me, <laughs> I can write anything on there. Yes. <laughs> Hebrew. <laughs> Okay, so th this, these, these words are aleph, yud, shin. And they spell ish, which in Hebrew means man. Okay, that's fine and dandy, but let's look at the actual letters. So this is aleph, this is yud, and this is shin. So now the beauty of Hebrew, unlike English, if you broke down English, you'd have N-A-M. What does N mean? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Ah, mm, doesn't mean anything. But in Hebrew, the beauty of the Hebrew alphabet is that every letter of the alphabet has a word, a picture, and a numerical value attached to it. Okay? So the word, or the, the letter Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet. And it basically means, uh, the, or, or the, the picture for the, for the letter is, uh, how am I going to write? You're not going to see that, are you? Um, okay. I'm going to write it anyway. So the, the, the letter Aleph, is, the, the picture that always represents Aleph is the, the ox or the sacrificial leader. It's a, it's, it's a number of different definitions, but it means a sacrificial leader position like the sacrificial ox or whatever. So when, when, when Jesus refers to his name as being Aleph Taf, my, I am the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega. He didn't say Alpha and Omega because he didn't speak Greek, he spoke Hebrew. So he calls himself Aleph Taf. The Aleph is, he's the sacrificial leader, he's the, he's the laid down ox, whatever. Taf means the cross, the finality of the work on the cross, finished. So he's, he's the sacrifice and the sacrifice, the, and that's where he refers himself. So, keep up, this is going to get nasty. So Aleph means sacrificial ox. Yud is, is the open hand of God, right? Hand of God. And Shin is actually uh, short for Shaddai. And it's the name that, it's the one letter that all the, all the Jews use to represent God. And, and if you go into uh, hotels, you'll see this little, 
little, it almost looked like a crown, but it's, it's kind of like our letter W. And it'll sit on, on a post above the doors or whatever. Everywhere you go, you'll see this little funky stylized Hebrew W-ish kind of letter because it's, it's a single letter and it just refers, it, it, it's the letter Shin and it refers to Shaddai, which is the name of God, okay? So, that's man. Now you got woman. Woman in, in Hebrew is Isha, right? So now, how do you spell Isha? It's spelt, again, with the Aleph, no Yud. has the W, the shin, and on the end of it, hey. So you have Aleph, shin, hey. That's how you spell Isha, which means woman. So what's, obviously, it's the same definition. Aleph is the sacrificial ox. Shin is the name for God himself, or the single letter for God. And hey, number five, is, stands for grace. So that's the difference between man and woman. Now, if, so if you read this, the actual word tells you a story. So a man is the culmination of the leader or the sacrificial ox, hand of God. So when God created man, he was to be the leader, and he was to be the, the difference between the, the woman and the man is that the man has the hand and the woman has the grace. Well, that's easy to see, right? I mean... He creates man to do, to accomplish, to task-oriented, to get things done. So it's the, it's the leader, hand of God. Then he creates woman to be a companion for man, and, and she is the leader of God's leader or whatever through grace. So when you combine the two, the hand of God and the grace of God, watch this. So then you pull those two letters out, and you have yud, and you have he, which means hand of grace. Now, if you put those two together, it spells Yah. And we all know through Matt's preaching that Yahweh is the name of God, right? So Yah is the first portion. yud Hey. The other letters are vav Hey. We know that because Matt said that a thousand times. Yeah. And you've all written that down in your Bibles. So the difference between man and woman is the hand of God, the uh, hand of grace. So you have the first name of God, Yah, the first part of God's name, put into the blending of a man and a woman, i.e., when, when God is first inside the union or marriage of these two, then what you have is the hand of God and the grace of God operating together as a single unit. Pretty cool, huh? I mean, all we do is M-A-N-M, woman, what to do? Okay, so that's... This is, this is how in-depth. Now, if you wanted to, each one of these letters has a numerical value, too. And I just ran out of time. I was, I was going to do that this morning to find out what the numerical value of all this was. But the other interesting thing is if you take... Okay, so you got, you got yud, hey, put together means ya. If you take, so if you're taking the yud and the hey out of these two words, what do you have left? You have aleph, shin, aleph, shin. So if you put those together, aleph... I'm just going to write a W. It's easier. So now you got Aleph, Shin. You know what? So those are the two letters. We know this is the, the, the leader of God and this is the, the person of God. But if you put those two together, this spells, and I'm not 100% sure of the, the spelling because I, I didn't print it out, but I'll, I'll just do it in English. Um, it spells the Hebrew word ash, which is the result of fire. When you burn something, you end up with ash. Or, or consumed. So, if you take man and woman and combine them, you have the hand of God and the grace of God working together in unison to accomplish a task. Remember, before we fell, God created us. We were perfect. Our provision was perfect. Everything was awesome in the garden. But we had a job. Remember? We were supposed to subdue the earth. And we were supposed to take dominion over blah, blah, blah. We were supposed to... I mean, I think, I think Eden was really small. And we were supposed to... Edenized the entire world. I think that was our job. So God puts those two elements together and gets and tells us, go do that. And those elements are together, are, are, are the hand and grace of God. Without the hand and grace of God taken out of these two people, all you have is burnt up. All you have is consumed. All you have is ash. 
you have useless whatever. Now, if you take the hand and the grace of God out of a marriage, I venture to say there's not really much left. It's just a... interesting, isn't it? Okay, that's a teaser just to get you tuned in to the story that I'm now going to tell you. So, let's get back to the, ra- uh, the road to- roadmap to riches. To understand God's character in, in the element of giving, we, 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 we believe, uh, without too much argument, that God's character is one of giving, and he's a benevolent God, and, he's, and he, uh, he wants us to have abundance. That's part of his character. Whether or not that's our circumstances doesn't change God's character. So we believe that to be part of God's character. So when we look at the call... The, the suggestion that there's our, our call to tithe, shall we say. I'm just going to use the word because in, the word in Hebrew is awesome. Um, and I, I wrote it out on my printer and then never even took the page with me. Anyway. Okay. So, we want a roadmap to riches. <clears throat> we've, heard, we've heard all about tithing before. And we've heard a lot of bad things about it. First of all, um, it has to be 10%. Um, Second of all, if you don't do it, you're cursed. Uh, Third of all, what's some bad things we've heard about tithing? Uh, Well, it's very law-driven. We know that we're trying to live by grace, not by law. So technically, by grace, we don't have to do anything. So why would we tithe? We don't have to tithe. We tithe because we then want to tithe, as opposed to... We have to. It's not a. It's not a law. Um, yeah, <laughs> over here. If you don't, if you don't tithe. Somebody's going to devour everything you have because we believe, or at least what's preached to us is, this is what you have to do. You have to fulfill this responsibility. Otherwise, if you don't, God's going to go. That's it. Man. You're cut off. You don't give me ten percent. I'll show you. I'll take the other ninety. Ah! And, and that's preached by people that think that God is really unhappy with us. But we know that's not true. That, sorry, that's a very sad face. <laughs> and then he sends down the lightning bolts and pfft, kills us. Okay, so that's what we've heard about tithing. So we have a real hard time um, using the word properly. We have a real hard time participating in the act. Um, I, I once heard, I forget what the number was, but I once heard somebody say there, that Jesus refers to money in the New Testament more than any other subject. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's really kind of uh, materialistic of him. And yet, I firmly believe that money, whatever form it represents, um, is the closest thing to our belief mechanism. What we do with our money is a better thermometer of what we believe than with anything else. I can't think of another resource or capability that I have in my life that best represents what I believe than how I, how I treat my money. To the point where Jesus says, the love of money doesn't lead to bad things. It is what? The root of? That's a pretty bold statement, don't you think? That the love of money is the root of all evil? I mean, I can see that the love of money would lead to some issues and some problems and some relational whatever, but the love of it is the root of all evil? Why is that? Because it's the love of money or what it represents that draws us away from the base, the, 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 the base understanding that, that God is our provision as opposed to what the resource we have. And this is why it's really interesting to watch, it's really interesting to watch people as they become wealthy. Um, I've noticed this in real estate, because real estate, there, I mean, you, there's some people that make or break years worth of salary in, in, in one deal. And, it, and that's, it can be feast and famine, right? You work all year to 
swing this deal and you finally sell the building, you make a million bucks. And so you can take two years off or whatever. So there's, there's a lot of money to be made in real estate. And you find there's a, there's a saying in real estate that when you're working on a deal of six figures, you don't have any friends. Because as soon as you get to a deal that's that big and the amount of money that you could make is that big, everybody in the office will try to undermine your job and, and, and try and steal a piece of that commission. And, it, and it's just a sad, brutal fact of the, the industry. But, um, so it's the love of the money that is the root of all evil. So and what does Jesus say about the root and the fruit of a tree? If the root of the tree is good, then the fruit's good. If the root is bad, then the, the fruit is bad. If our love and our attention and our, compassion, our, our passion is bound up in our resource or what we, can, what we can attain, then it's going to be the root of all the things that wind up being bad. And this is where the Hebrew word comes in really handy. I'll show you. Nope. You can be poor and have a love of money. You know what the funny thing is? The, the love of money, the antithesis of the love of money is... You either have you, the opposite of love of money is is trust in God. And so, if 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 you're, and this is where wisdom comes in, understanding who Jesus is and understanding who God is, what His character is, and what He wants for you. If you truly understood that thoroughly, then you wouldn't have a love of money. I mean, it, it you wouldn't be attached to it. You'd be attached to God. And if God gave you a little, you'd be happy. If He gave you a lot, you'd be happy. You would actually be free. You you'd be safe is a better word. You'd be safe for God to bless abundantly if you understood that he is your provision, not the money. Because then when he gives you way more than you need, you're just going, hey, this is way more than I need. Now, does God need you to then take that money and give it back to him because he's got a budget he's got to meet, you know, and he's got some needs over there and he's trying to meet those. Does God need your money? Uh, Joseph Prince was saying the other day, yeah, because the, the, the gold highway in heaven's got a pothole, so he needs some money to fix that with more gold. I mean, that's how stupid it is. I mean, does God need your money? No. What God needs is your heart and your attention and your focus. So if the, the more we fully understand that he's our provision as opposed to the love of money or that the money is our provision or the resource, whatever resource it is, the more we understand that, the more safe we are for God to bless. Because when he blesses us, all we're going to do is be more enthralled with who he is and suddenly our resource becomes a resource as opposed to something I hold on to. So, um, now let's look at the word tithe <coughs> in Hebrew. <coughs> How are we doing on time? Okay, so, bear with my really bad Hebrew. Okay, so here's... Here's the Hebrew. Again. Oh my goodness. Whoa. Okay, there's there's <laughs> I don't even know why I wrote it, because it's not gonna make any sense. So here's here's the word. This is the word tithe. In Hebrew. Now, instead of writing down the Hebrew letters, you can write down this word. Ma'aser. Ser. Ma'aser. All right? That's what this word in Hebrew is. And it's made up from the letters of mem, ayin, shin. See, you already recognize that letter. That W, shin, right? Stands for what? Yeah, shin name for God. Yeah. See? You guys are learning. It's awesome. Um, can't read my own writing. Oh, Resh. Okay. So, here's the, the, the word in Hebrew, ma'aser, means to tithe in Hebrew. And it's made up, reading this way again, mem, ayin, these are the letters, shin, resh. So those are the letters of the Hebrew alphabet that spell maser, maaser, all right? So again, because Hebrew is deeper than English, we can go further into this word and discover what it actually means letter by letter, shall we? Mem is a picture of water, or commonly referred to as the Holy Spirit. Ayin 
interestingly enough, is a picture of an eye. Shin, again, name for God. Resh is a picture of head. Head. Can anybody read that stuff? Like, is there any purpose to write it down? Okay, so like we did with, with man and woman, we then go back, we go deeper into the word tithe, ma'aser, and we, we look at the letters, mem, ayin, shin, resh. And what it spells out and means letter by letter is the water or the Holy Spirit influencing our eye to see God as our head, we will tithe. When we let the Holy Spirit direct our eye to God as our head, then we're free to tithe. We're free to ma'aser, right? Now, I bet you're all wondering, can you see down the bottom part? I bet you're all wondering what the word wealth in Hebrew is. And this is why tithe is attached to, to wealth. Not because if you don't tithe, he's going to steal your money. Here's the reason why. So wealth is made up of, of the, the, the yin, the shin, and the resh. A-N, sorry, is that right? Yeah, A-N, shin, resh. Okay, so when, when our eye sees God as our head, we are wealthy. How do we get to the point where our eye sees God as the head and hence we are wealthy? And remember what we said in the previous one, that real wealth is being healthy, wealthy, and wise? So how do we get to the point where, we, where our eye, remember, it's all about right believing, not right living. Right living comes from right believing. So how do we get to the point where we believe that our, and our eye sees God as our head? Through the direction of the Holy Spirit. And if you just take the mem, which is the Holy Spirit, and add it to our desire to see God as our head, then you have tithe. So the significance of that is when the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit influences us to see, to, for our eye to see God as the head, we tithe. Ma'aser. And actually, this, this word without the mem in it is, as you can tell, see, right there, is aser in Hebrew, which means wealth. It also can be translated, if you put another S in there, another root word, as happiness. Interesting. So, to be truly happy, to be truly wealthy, we need to see God as our head. If we see God as the head of everything we do and have, we won't worry about our money. We won't have the love of money. We won't worry about how much we have and we've got to hold on to it. In fact, the Holy Spirit leading us, we'll just, we'll, we'll just stick a mem on there and we'll maser, we'll tithe. We'll gladly take our first fruits and give them back to God because we see God as our head. If he's given us something, we'll give him a piece back. Easy. He's just going to give us more. And the, the, the more deeply we understand and see God as our head, the safer we are for God to bless. And when God blesses us, then we just allow the Spirit to guide us into our memayin shin reshing, masering, tithing back to God. See how that works? This is truly a, this is truly a roadmap to riches because... If you don't have this, you're not safe to bless. Because wealth in the hands of an idiot, as we so delicately put, is not safe. So when you have this, you're safe to bless. And when you are blessed, you maser. Because the, 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 the response to this, the Holy Spirit guides us into giving. And that's money, time, effort. Compassion, everything. It's not just your money. It's all things that make up wealth. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Pretty cool. Oh, and it could just go so much further, too. Okay. Now. Okay, now I want to get into... Okay, so first of all, be before we go into more Hebrew... Um, I know, it's a, I know it's a tricky subject. Um, right believing, 
leads to right living. The right belief mechanism in the fact that I understand that God is the head of my life. I see him as the forefront of everything. I see him in in the potential of, of what's happening in my life on a circumstantial basis. I see him, uh, you know, we, we, we coined the phrase back when we were broke. Um, we're, not, we're not worried about money. It's just another opportunity to trust God. And you go, yeah, that, <laughs> that's like poor people saying money can't buy you happiness. I guarantee it's only poor people saying that. <laughs> the rich people are going, dude, you just don't know where to shop. <laughs> So the poor people make excuses for the fact they're poor by saying, well, money can't buy you happiness. When in actual fact, what they're yearning for more than anything is money. So we were sitting there when we were broke and we're going, yeah, well, you know, we're not worried. We're, we're just, it's just another opportunity to trust God. And in my mind, I'm thinking, that doesn't even rest right in my, in, my, in my head because I am worried about the fact that I can't pay my bills and whatever. But in my heart, I want to believe. I want to believe. I want my eye to see God as the head of my life, even when I'm broke, even when I'm not feeling well, even when calamity happens all around me, even when circumstances suggest that it's just chaos out there. I want my heart to see God as my head. And when I, that belief is in me thoroughly, I will mem everything. I will give. I will tithe. I will become a ma'aser of my life. And it's not just putting money in the offering plate or helping little ladies across the street or whatever you can think of tithing on your resources. It's a matter of, of, of developing a giving spirit or a tithing kind of... It's funny because tithing is, is in, in, in scriptures is referred to as first fruits. First fruits. The first fruits is actually... Uh, comes from the same root word. To tithe or the first fruits, it comes from the same ma'aser word. So the first fruits, when it talks about it in, in Hebrews, it's, it's an issue of, and I've heard this argument all the time, but they always bring up Malachi. You know, if you don't, if you don't tithe, you know, the devourer will come, or you're, you're cursed with the curse if you don't tithe. When in actual fact, what Malachi is referring to, I think he preached on this once, didn't he? Um, he's preached on everything. I'm just regurgitating your messages. <laughs> uh, what actually... What Malachi is actually referring to is that everything is subject to the curse on this earth. And so when you tithe, when you take your first fruits and you ma'aser it, you're saying God is the head of everything and you're sanctifying your money. You're sanctifying your time. You're sanctifying your health. And what is sanctified and holy, no tsunami can touch. No economy can touch. No fear can touch. And so the issue about tithing in Malachi isn't that if you don't do it, you're robbing from God and he's going to take the rest of your money. The issue is everything that kind of is generated on this planet is kind of under the curse of this planet. And it's not run by righteous people. So if you make money, you'll stand to lose your money because it's a cursed system. The economy is, oh my goodness, if we really understood how the economy of the world works, I'd be more fearful than I am regarding the future because it's, it's all run on a debt system that's about to crater someday. I mean, it's, it's a mess. But if I fully understand that God is my head, then I'll give. I don't care. My money is now sanctified. It's holy. I can give it away. I can give a tenth away. I can tithe it. I can give it all away. It doesn't matter. Because as long as I see God as the head of my money, my time, my efforts, my, my attention, my belief mechanism, none of the world's nonsense can touch me. What does it say in Isaiah 55 that um, I should just look it up. Uh, something about uh, the, the sudden panic of the earth won't touch you. Has no effect on you. I mean, they're, they're, they're freaking out because, uh, you know, the subprime fell apart and all the banks lost money and everybody lost their 401ks and all that kind of stuff or whatever. But God's your head. He can supply it all back the next day. And as long as you see God as your head, then you're tithing on your life. It's not just money. But this is referring to the process of allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us to the belief that, that let our eyes see that God is the head. Now, having said all that, let us actually talk about true wealth. So I'm, I'm okay. I'm sitting there this morning and I'm going through this and I'm reading Hebrews and I'm reading uh, about the first fruits and it talks about... Uh, if the root of the tree is holy, then the rest of the tree is holy. 
Um, you, you can't, if, if you have a tree in your, in, in your front yard and it's green and full of fruit, let's say, this is Alberta, there's no fruit in Alberta, but uh, just imagine it. There's a, there's a fruitful tree in your front yard, but for some reason you dig down and you find that all the roots are dead. How long do you think that fruitful tree is going to stay fruitful? If the roots are dead, then it's only a matter of time before the, the deadness comes up into the tree and everything, all the leaves fall off, all the fruit falls off, and the tree dies. Now, you can look at that same tree, and it could be barren. I don't know if you've ever been out to the Okanagan um, right after um, the, the apple harvest season or whatever, where they take all the apples off the tree and the harvest is done, and then the gardeners go in and they prune the apple trees back. Have you ever seen a pruned apple tree? It's a trunk with two big sticks coming out and a couple of little branches. It looks like it was hacked up by a chainsaw. It's just, it doesn't even look like a tree anymore. But they trim it all back down so that it produces more fruit instead of more leaves. And then the next year you see that same hacked up tree bearing even more fruit. Now the interesting thing is, depending on what part of the season you see it, it looks dead. It looks beat up, hacked up, cut up, and dead. But the roots are healthy, so next year, guess what? Boom. Covered in apples. So it doesn't matter what the, what the tree in your yard looks like. It's what the, what's the roots are doing. So if the roots are good, the tree is going to be good. So when we're talking about health and wealth and wisdom, we're talking about, I, okay, let's, let's just put it all together and, and call, it, call it wealth. Okay? Because true, true wealth, we understand, is being all those things together. So I'm sitting there this morning, and I'm, I'm going through all this Greek stuff, and I'm pulling out all these letters, and I'm trying to figure out what it all means. And the entire time, I'm sitting there writing it in my journal and trying to figure out how I'm going to convey this to people. I, I hear this, this nagging in the back of my mind. It's like God reminding me, yeah, that, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good, and, and that's good. But, but there's something there for today. There's something there for now, and you've got to dig deeper. And so I'm, I'm watching all the letters on the screen pull up, and I'm pulling out their numerical values and their letters. I'm trying to sentences and all sorts of weird things. And I come back, and God says, go back to wealth. So we understand that in, inside every English word or every Hebrew word, there's, 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 there's letters that have pictures that, that actually state a story inside scripture. Uh, I remember Matt was preaching on, uh, I gotta write this down, it's really cool, because you, you'll probably wanna write it. Remember when he was preaching on Ruth? Okay, I had spent the entire week, that week, reading Ruth, coincidentally, and came to this conclusion. While I was reading the story, I found it really interesting that, that the, 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 the story in the Bible would go through what happened to Ruth and Boaz, and and in the end, when it was all said and done, and then they have this little genealogy they stick on the end. And, and Boaz took Ruth as his wife, and they begat, boom, 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 boom. And, and so what happens is Ro, uh, Boaz marries Ruth, and they give birth to Obed, who gives birth to Jesse, who gives birth to David. Now, the genealogy keeps going, right? But in the book of Ruth, right at the last, last two verses or whatever, it says, so here's the story, la di da di da so then Boaz and Ruth get married and he takes her. Okay, so then we dig into this deeper and go, well, that's an interesting little genealogy it threw in there. There's got to be meaning to that, so let's go find out what the meanings are. Then we realize that Boaz means to come swiftly, swiftly. Ruth meant friend or in her pre-state friend less, or added friend. So boy, so the, the coming swiftly marry, marries the friend, and their offspring are Obed, Jesse, and David. And Obed means... Oh, God. <laughs> There's one... See, I, I printed it out, and I left it on the printer. Um... I, I think, it, yeah, well, I just, I don't want to get it wrong, but I think it's, because I don't want to give the bottom part away. 
I think it's, um, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it's, uh, oh, man. Yes, that's it. Or serves, serves. Serves. Obed means to serve. Jesse means gifts of wealth. And David means the beloved. So you have the type of Christ, Boaz, in the story, who takes Ruth as his friend, or takes, becomes, comes swiftly to befriend Ruth, the friend less, because she's a Moabite woman. She doesn't belong in the genealogy. And the two of them, their offspring, serves gifts of wealth to the beloved. That's the story behind the names in that book. And I thought that was amazing. So, those are the names. Now let's go back to this wealth concept. Um, okay, so, then I started looking at, and I, when I, when I tell you this last piece, it'll be awesome, and, and I'm, I'm hoping it'll be a huge... Okay, what it is is this. It's, it's, it's bringing a, a concept of truth back down to earth so, so we can reach out and embrace it and go, I knew that was true all along, but I, now, I, now I really know it's true, and so I'm going to embrace this. The, the whole idea of, of wealth being that when we see God as our head, if we understood that, if we believed that, then we would give freely of what we have because we understand that he's our head. That concept. Okay. So then I was, I was writing it down, and I asked God, okay, what, so what's for today specifically? And he said, we have to go into the numbers. I was like, oh, okay. So I went into the old Jewish calendar, and I pulled out the numerical value for the year 2013. You ready for this? Okay, now how do you find the Jewish year from our year? This is the Gregorian calendar. We're in the year 2013. 2013 doesn't have much significance when it comes to, to Hebrew and, and because they don't use that calendar. So here's a quick and easy way to find out what Jewish year... Does anybody know what Jewish year it is this year? Here's a quick and easy way to find out. You take, providing it's after Rosh Hashanah, which is in September, you minus 1,240 and you add 5,000. That's how you figure out what the Jewish year is. So being that 2013 is, Rosh Hashanah is their, their, the Jewish New Year, and it's in September, oh, September 17th this year. So they're one year ahead of us, and, but as of January, we'll be 2013, so we'll catch up. Otherwise, if we're going with 2012, you just add, you just add one to it. But we're, we're, we're in that year. We're, we're talking about tomorrow. Okay. So if you take 2013 minus 1,240 and add 5,000, you get the Jewish year of 5,773. Okay? That's what, that's the year that we're in right now. Now here's where it gets interesting. Okay. So we, we know that each Hebrew letter has a picture and, and, a, and a term attached to it, but also has a numerical value. So in reverse, you can go to the numerical value of any number and find the Jew... And now, remember, Hebrew doesn't have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then letters. It uses letters for numbers, right? Very confusing, but it's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so this is, this is the year we're in. This is the year that the Gregorian calendar is catching up to in two days, okay? So now, again, in reverse, we have to start over here. So the 5,000, the way they do it is they have numbers... For the alphabet, they go up to, they go Aleph, Bet, Gamel, Damet, He, Bav, up to nine. And then the next ones are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 90. And then the numerical values after that are in the hundreds. So, and here's how they do it in ancient times. So the five is He, the seven is, or, or sorry, I gotta do this. I gotta do this the other way, okay? So it's 5,700, because they're reading this way. So the hay with a, a tick on it would be, instead of, instead of five, it would be 5,000, right? So this is how they write the number. 
This is how the Hebrews would write 5,773. Hey with a, a slash. Then the 700, which they don't have a, they don't have a 700. What they would do is they would combine, because it only goes up to four. So they'd, they'd combine 400 with 300. Okay? So the 400 is represented by Tav. Uh, let me write these down for you, just because I know you're writing them in your books. You really got to write this one down. This is cool. Tav, so hey, Tav. Um, I, again, we're, we're in the, uh, and then the 300 would be Shin. See, there's that Shin again. Shin. And then what you would do, in, the Hebrews would do this. They'd go, ching, ching. They'd put two of those things so that you know it's not a word. It's actually numbers. So it's 5,700. The 70 is represented by the ayin. Again, we, we've already seen that one, right? Ayin. And then the 3 is represented by gmel. This is a hard one to write. No representation whatsoever. Gamel. Okay, so this is this is the Hebrew number, reading from right to left. This is the Hebrew number 5,773, which is the Hebrew year. They started it in September. We're going to join them in two days. So we're at 5,773. They are represented by the letters in their numerical value, He, Tav, Shin, Ein, Gemel. Right? So now we're not talking about a word in Hebrew that has a separate meaning. We're talking about a number that has letters that have separate meanings that has a statement. So then if you go, He is grace, Tav is uh, the cross or eternal, uh, we'll call it value, I guess, eternal value of the cross. So the, the not the event of the cross, but uh, what it means, what it represents. Um, Shin is uh, the letter that represents God, the name for God. Ayin is... Again, we all know that. That's the I. And then the letter Gamel has a picture of a camel. Now, you're like me, that doesn't mean anything. So then I went deeper. And I pulled out all the root expressions for those letters. And believe me, I printed them all out straight from the Jewish books, you name it. And... The, so, so I'm going to add the subsequent meanings to these, these pictures. These are all pictures, and they have subsequent meanings. So grace is um, thought and speech and action. The cross, again, eternal value or the seal of creation uh, Shin is Shaddai, the name for God, or represents the entity of God, but it's also the eternal flame. Is this burning an eternal flame? Uh, Ayin is the I or divine <coughs> providence. And Gamel is the camel who represented the transport of resources, i.e. the camels where the, you stack them up and you go through the desert. Subsequent uh, meanings or reward or punishment or riches. All right? You still don't know where this is going. We are in the year 5,773. 
when the grace of what Jesus did on the cross causes God's eye, or, sorry, causes God's eye to turn and transport riches. And I went in as deep as you possibly could into these meanings to find that because I just wanted to make sure that was right. I didn't want to just create a sentence out of nothing. So basically what it's saying is 5,773 is the year when grace from the cross allows God to turn his eye to the transport of riches to his Now, I did not plan that when I got up this morning. All I was doing was, I started with man and woman, and it ended up here. And the funny thing is, the entire time I was sitting there looking at those words and trying to pull out the meanings or whatever, God kept saying, come back to the numbers, come back to the numbers. And I thought, well, what, the numbers uh, uh, for man, like Chin, Resh, and you, I don't understand. And he said, no, come back to the numbers. So I realized that, hey, I'm preaching the day before the new year. So what is the new year? What year is it? It's 5,773. And every Jewish, Hebrew, study, online, whatever, I, I looked for ones that would contradict it, and they didn't. In fact, one has a Jewish sentence underneath the whole thing that basically says, because of great, the grace of the cross, God can turn his eye to transporting riches to his people. Written right on it, and this is not a Christian site. This is a, a Hebrew Site. And they're saying that 5,773 is the year when, because of grace of the cross, God will turn his eye to transporting riches to his people. There you go.